All right, everybody, come on in, sit down. Still a couple of seats up front. I promise not to throw too many things. Oh. All right. So this is the point at which I say, hopefully you're here for CS162. If you're not, you should jump up and scream, I'm in the wrong classroom, and go out and go somewhere else, perhaps. But uh, welcome. Um, my name is John Kubitowicz. Uh Most people can't pronounce my last name, so they call me Professor Kuby, and you're welcome to do that as well. Um, and I'll introduce myself a little bit uh, later, and uh, the TAs as well. But uh, welcome to CX162. This is a huge classroom. I'm assuming there are a number of you that are on the wait list. Uh, how many people are on the wait list still? A few of you? Okay. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Well, let's start and dive in here just to get moving. Um, one of the things that I think is so exciting about right now is we have this big artifact that a lot of people uh, in the rest of the world are not aware of. You're very aware of the internet. Everybody can kind of look very carefully at this. Um, there are many slices like this that you can see. If you actually look carefully down here, you'll see that this is from ancient history. This is 1999. But if we took one from today, what you would find is there's actually so many nodes you couldn't even possibly, you know, you get this sort of solid ball. And What's so exciting about this is not just that it provides new ways for everybody to communicate and tie uh, civilizations together, it also is starting to talk about tying everything else together as well, okay? And we're going to talk a bit about the Internet of Things as we go on, which is a new buzz phrase being used by lots of uh, companies. I don't know, I've even started seeing commercials about the Internet of, Internet of Things, and that's when you knew something is truly arrived, I guess, when it shows up during Big Bang Theory or whatever it is you like to watch. But it's kind of interesting um, to see graphs like this. What you see in the far left is 1969, uh, probably a, a, a year that most of you have never uh, were not around at that time. And what you see is a little tiny thing here called the ARPANET. And what was interesting about the ARPANET was the addressing of the ARPANET uh, could not allow more than 256 uh, nodes on the network. Okay, you guys may even have 256 nodes in your home network today. Okay, but this was the ARPANET, and uh, what's kind of interesting is during this period from 69 to 90, there was a whole lot that went on in terms of communication. But in fact, uh, the rest of the world that's not academics really didn't know about it until 1990s when HTTP got uh, announced, and then all of a sudden we had this explosion of users. And, you know, at this point, we had a small number of users. At this point, you know, we've got Facebook, uh, you know, and this uh, exponential growth in users. And uh, last count, we have probably about 3 billion people that are all interacting over the Internet. So this is pretty exciting artifact. Now, of course, this is not a class on networking, but this sets the context for this class. Okay, and I actually think that this is probably one of the most exciting times to be working in operating systems because as an operating systems person, you've got to figure out how to manage all of these users and devices. Okay? And, you know, operating systems really are at the heart of it. And they're the things that are uh, controlling the complexity. Now, of course, there's some interesting aspects of hardware, which I'll mention a little bit too, which has really enabled all of this. But uh, it's kind of interesting when you can have graphs that are meaningful to people about how Android uh, App Store overtook the Apple App Store at a certain number of apps, and we're talking 70, you know, 700,000 or a million apps here or there. And this means something to my dad. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? And um, I won't go into the religious wars over you know, whether you're a, an iPhone person or an Android person. Um, but what is interesting is all of these operating systems have kind of key building blocks in them. They've got scheduling, concurrency, address spaces, protection, isolation, security. Boy, we'll have to say something about that. Networking, uh, of course. All sorts of distributed systems is issues. There's persistent storage. How many people here store data in the cloud? 
How many of you know what that means? Wow, okay. How many people think they know what it means but probably don't? Yeah, <laughs> those are the honest ones. The cloud is this funny nebulous thing, which I'm going to have a few things to say about later in the term as well. But um, this notion of persistent storage is important. I'd like to take pictures and you know, make sure that they're around in 100 years or 1,000 years, you know, assuming people are going to care about my pictures in 1,000 years. Of course they are, right? Um, but let's start with something pretty simple here. So if you were to say what's in a search query, everybody here has done a search, right? Even if you are an Apple user, oops, I mean an, uh, an Android user. So um, what happens when you go to uh, search something and uh, find something on the net? Well, the first thing that actually happens is, and this is very complicated, right? The first thing is your uh, search site or website has to actually talk to a set of DNS servers, those DNS servers communicate with one another and transform your uh, human-readable name into an IP address. And then from that IP address, which comes back, then it gets to route through the, the rest of the internet. Now, this picture is a little funny because the DNS servers are actually on the internet, but I thought I would separate this for a moment. And, you know, that request goes through, and then it goes to some big data center somewhere, and Google, Yahoo, uh, Amazon, you name it, they're all like this. The, the request comes in, and there's actually a load balancer which takes your supposedly unique IP address that you got, and it actually chooses which of a whole bunch of different servers are actually going to satisfy that. And then um, the search is completed over a whole cluster of, of machines in the cloud, whatever that means. And then uh, your result comes back. And then, of course, you've got to add ads in there because, you know, what's, what's a good search without an ad um, for whatever you know, a uh, weird sort of thing that you might want to be uh, getting, and then comes back with your response. Now, if you look at all of these pieces in here, there are operating systems underneath all of them. So obviously there's the uh, Apple iOS uh, in this picture. There are probably Linux or, um, yeah, probably Linux running on the DNS servers. The internet routers have uh, some unique real-time operating systems on them. The data center itself the load balancers probably also have a, a real-time operating system on them. The search indexes are probably back to Linux again these days. The ad servers, yeah, probably Linux again, but certainly coupled with huge storage, uh, um, you know, lots of lots of storage, lots of disk drives, SSDs, and so on. And that's all managed by operating systems. The result comes back, and voila, you get your search. So you did something pretty simple, you thought, but there was a whole bunch of components involved. And what's interesting about that, as far as I'm concerned, is that somehow it works. Has anybody ever thought about the fact that that actually works? Okay, kind of surprising, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen pieces of this go together over the years, and the fact that it actually does work is astounding to me. Okay, and I, I'm, you know, I allow you to be astounded as well. You should be, because it's pretty complicated. And you'll be able to understand all the pieces, um, but the fact that it actually gives you a result is pretty interesting. Okay. So why should you take 162? Well, some of you are actually going to end up designing and building operating systems. Is there anybody in here who feels like they want to be designing operating systems for their life? Okay. A few of you. That's good. Um, that's a kind of a fun place to be because operating systems are branching out into not just you know, Linux or iOS. They're actually getting into some pretty interesting sort of realms these days. Many of you are actually going to create complex systems that use the operating systems. And maybe you're going to build software. You build, some of you will build hardware. And these design patterns that we're going to come up with actually show up at all levels. So what's kind of interesting is, um, technically speaking, as I'll say a little bit later, I'm actually a computer architect. Uh, although I've done a lot of work in operating systems as well over the years. And the ideas in computer architecture show up in operating systems. And the ideas in operating systems show up in computer architecture. So um, these concepts are very transportable. And then all of you are going to build applications. Okay, for no other reason than you have to pass the class here, so you get to build some applications. But um, I'm going to assume that you're going to do more applications as time goes on. Okay? So... This is probably a good reason to take 162. So today, what I want to do is uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to where we're going this term. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what an operating system is and maybe what it's not. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some examples of operating systems design. Um, 
I'm hopefully going to help you understand why it's so exciting to be designing operating systems and what makes every sort of new operating system a little different from the previous ones. And uh, somewhere along the way, I'll actually tell you something about the class, since it is the first day and you want to know kind of what you're getting yourselves into. But OK, are we all ready for this? Does this sound good? OK. So what is an operating system? Well, this is kind of interesting because you ask you know, five different people who actually design operating systems what the operating system is, and they'll all give you slightly different answers. OK, so um, some possible good answers are a convenient abstraction of complex hardware devices. So you've got hardware that's complicated. The OS abstracts it in a useful way, so you've got applications on top. OK, that's a pretty good one. Um, some might say it's a way of providing protected access to shared resources. So this hardware has some resources like disk drives and network cards and so on that uh, are going to be shared. And the operating system gives you protected access to that. Uh, we're going to say a lot about what that protected access really means in the next month or whatever. But among other things, you can imagine that if you store your files in some part of a disk and somebody else is using the same piece of hardware, you'd like for them not to be able to just get your files. Right? So there is some level of protection there that's desirable. So clearly, there's security and authentication involved. And there's also communication among logical entities. So among other things, for instance, these applications need to communicate with each other and so on. So that might give you a little idea what an operating system does, but probably not enough. Um, it's an operator of, of form, right? So. Uh, this is actually before my time, believe it or not. But you know, there was a time where you made a phone call and there was somebody that actually plugged a wire in. Okay, and um, there were computer operators at uh, one time that uh, actually had to coordinate a lot of resources. Today, operating systems, uh, modern operating systems, tend to do a lot of the same coordination that you had humans doing at one point in time. Okay. So what I want to do as a very gentle introduction here is say a little bit about the, some OS basics. And then over the next couple lectures, we're going to dive into a few more of those basics. And one of the reasons we're going to dive in sort of at a user view is uh, it's going to be your first couple of homeworks in this class are actually going to learn the system level programmer's view of an operating system so that when we actually dive in, you'll have an idea of what you're talking about, Okay, rather than diving in to the, the uh, depths of operating systems right away. We're going to get you a little bit of a uh, user's view of them. And so in um, a typical situation that requires an operating system, you've got software and hardware. OK, that's not too surprising. But inside that hardware, you probably have a processor and memory at, at minimum. And then you have some devices, like storage devices. These might be uh, um, disk drives. They might be flash storage devices. You have some networks. You have some displays and other inputs. And the real trick is how to give a nice, clean uh, abstraction layer, basically, for the software to get access to this hardware. Okay? And so that is typically called OS hardware virtualization. It's a way, basically, of taking this hardware, which is going to vary a lot, and giving you a virtualization of it that's sort of common across a lot of hardware. And as a result, it's easy to program. If you imagine what would happen if you were a programmer that had to adapt every piece of software that you wrote to every possible piece of hardware that it was going to run on, you'd go crazy. Right? So this abstraction layer actually gives us the ability to write the software once and run it in many places. Okay? Now, uh, part of this uh, virtualization layer, we can kind of look in the hardware. We talk about the instruction set architecture, and that gives us the ability to put the hardware virtualization layer together. And on top of that, we're going to design things like processes, address spaces, files, uh, windowing systems, sockets, threads, et cetera. These are some of the concepts that we're going to want to get access to right away uh, in your first few hardware uh, assignments that are provided by the OS virtualization layer that make it possible to design software. So basically, this virtualization layer, or the operating system in many cases, are going to provide these guys. And then the software, uh, the writer, is going to write on top of them. And that's going to be where we're going in the first few weeks. Now, um, this is one of my favorite very old slides from David Patterson. Anybody taking a class with Patterson? OK, he's always very fun. But uh, this particular uh, view of the hardware software interface is really, um, he used to say, this is Microsoft dancing on Intel. <laughs> 
Okay, and so this is basically Intel holding up the solid interface so that the Microsoft uh, software uh, guys can dance on top of it. Now, of course, um, what does that really mean? It means that uh, somehow this firm instruction set never changes, and then Microsoft can take advantage of that to write good software. Okay. And why are interfaces designed in a particular way? Well, if you took 152, you'd find out that there's a lot of stuff in computer hardware architecture that's really historic. Okay, that, you know, well, the Intel processor is that way just because it ended up that way. Okay, and there's a lot of classes that we have, like 152 and 160 and 169 and so on, that all look at various interfaces and uh, things like, you know, should responsibilities be pushed across boundaries and so on. But it's really the more important thing to get out of this sort of discussion is it's about coming up with a nice clean layer that other people can use while you're working underneath. Okay? And uh, that's kind of, in this class, the hardware virtualization layer. I will, um, by the way, relate a, an interesting story. I can't resist since I'm a, an architect. But there was a time in the 90s when... Uh, there was a bug in the floating point unit. Did anybody ever hear this story? Okay, there was a bug in the Intel floating point unit such that if you divided, you use the divide instruction, uh, a small number of bits were wrong, and that would affect a very rare number of applications that needed extreme precision in their division. Okay, so what, did, what was Intel's reaction to finding this? They set out and told their customers, well, you don't you have to convince us that you really need that accurate a division. And if you manage to do that, then we'll give you a new chip. Okay, now what happened was they pissed off a lot of customers. Okay, how dare they tell, you know, ask me to prove to them that I need their hardware to work. And that was actually a disaster for Intel, and they eventually ended up giving them out to everybody who asked. Okay, but the interface is so incredibly important. It actually made it to the New York Times, by the way. Uh, you can imagine... When was the last time a bug in a piece of Microsoft software made it to the New York Times? Ask yourself that question. So back to our little story. So we've got um, this question of how we turn programs into processes, which is going to also uh, be something we learn about uh, next time, pretty much. And the idea here really is, what is the difference between a program and a process? Well, a program is the thing you write. A process is an instance of the program that's running. Okay, so you imagine uh, you write your program once and you run it five times. There can be five processes, which are five instances of that program. Okay, and so what that really means is the software that you've written gets loaded into memory, and now you've got a set of registers in the processor that are now devoted to it, and as a result, that, pro that program becomes an executing entity or a process. Okay. And, of course, there's an operating system which also needs to run. And so one of the things that's kind of interesting is this notion of context switch, which we'll talk about, which is this processor is busy devoting its registers to the memory, but a timer interrupt shows up, and now, as a result, we sort of clone the registers that matter uh, for that process and put them aside, and now the pro processor is busy running the operating system instead of the program. And what it can do is pick some other program to run, and switch back, and now we had one program running or one process running, and we switch over to another process that's running. Okay? And that is how you get the illusion of more than one thing running at a time, even when you only have one processor going. There's a timer interrupt. Operating system takes the current pro uh, process, switches it out, puts a new one in, runs it, and it switches fast enough that you don't notice the difference. Okay? That's called a context switch. Are there any questions on that? Okay, so, um, and of course, another interesting thing is if we're going to have lots of processes, because there are many different programs uh, all loaded and many different instances of programs loaded, and so now the question is sort of how, who decides uh, which instance of a program or which process actually gets to use the processor? That's called scheduling. Okay, and that's kind of interesting because the scheduler, there are many varieties of schedulers. Some of them are real-time. We got to make sure that when you press the brakes on your car, that car stops. How many people think that's probably a good plan? Okay, All right. well, I, okay, I'll I'll keep that for you if you don't think that's a good plan, but it's a pretty good plan. Um, you can imagine other scheduling decisions, like I want to make sure among all the processes that are running, there's fairness. Everybody gets a fair share of the processor. Okay, 
Any of you, we've had some terminal servers in the departments over the years where you log in and you're sharing a machine with lots of people. Am I really dating myself here, or has anybody experienced that? And, and what happens when too many people are logged in? Very slow. Okay, the reason is, of course, the, the operating system is busy switching between all of those people trying to be fair, but the net result is you see such a little bit of the processor, you get annoyed and go get your coffee and then come back hopefully at midnight or something when it's less used, right? So that's uh, scheduling. The other thing that's kind of interesting is protection, and protection is uh, very important here because if this green process tries to stomp on the red process or tries to read private data from the red process, that's a problem. And the protection mechanisms basically prevent that kind of cross-flow of information. Once again, this is an important aspect of the operating system. Now, this protection boundary we typically think of as kind of dividing all the pieces of hardware in the operating system from the user-level processes that are running, and these are all words I'm throwing out here. You'll, get, you'll know what they mean soon if, they, if you don't know. So finally, of course, a big thing that the operating system does is I.O., and what I.O. really means is I.O. means providing a virtual abstraction of the devices to the processes that are running. And... You know, so typically we have a storage abstraction, which is called a file system, right? Uh, we typically have a networking abstraction like sockets, which will tell you a little bit about what sockets are. And that abstraction is uh, got to go through the protection boundary because, once again, you can have different people's files stored on a given disk and um, want to make sure that different processes only get access to the files they're supposed to. Okay, and under the covers is a whole bunch of hardware. I'm going to show you a picture a little bit more about this later, but lots of stuff that as a user you don't have to worry about. Okay, there's controllers and buses, you know, and, and different uh, interfaces that the disks are plugged into, and all of that stuff is managed by the operating system in a way that you as a user, when you're writing software, don't have to worry about. Right. The simplest thing to think about is you... Uh, store your files, excuse me, let's say pictures. You store pictures from a camera on a little USB stick. How many people own a USB stick? Okay. Uh, and then you plug it into your laptop and it gets stored on the disk drive. Those two types of storage are completely transparent as far as uh, your file browser is concerned because you go to the file browser, you go to the, the, the uh, file or the uh, the uh, disk drive that is the disk drive, and you pull pictures off of it and copy them over to the USB stick and vice versa, and you don't have to care that there's a physical USB stick under there. You could just as well be copying between two USB sticks or two disks. It's the same thing, okay? And that's all what the operating system has to manage. And it is interesting. I don't know what the absolute latest statistics are, but there have been many statistics about why operating systems crash and by the way, what is the number one thing that causes operating systems to crash? To the tune of more than 43 to 50 percent of crashes are caused by this. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah. Drivers? Yes. Device drivers. Why? This is the great question, right? So why, why do device drivers tend to crash operating systems a lot? Anybody want to give me some reasons? Yeah. Sure, okay, so yeah, you can plug them in or take them out without really warning the operating system so it doesn't know what's going on. What else? Yeah. That's right. So they're in the kernel. They're at very low level. So if the device driver makes a mistake, we got problems. What else? Yeah, the back. Yeah, same idea, right? I've got access to all the memory. I can screw it up. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so third party. That's There we go. That, I was definitely looking for third party. So the problem is device drivers are written from somebody who's not the operating system writer. Okay. And as a result, you have no idea <laughs> the quality of the device driver, okay? And how many of you, and I'm going to raise my hand here, have a new device, and you say, oh, you got to download a device driver, and you say yes, you know, and this doesn't, this is not signed correctly by uh, an authority that anybody knows about. Do you still want to download it? Yes. <laughs> right? 
And the net effect is you probably just loaded a virus onto your machine and didn't know it, right? Now, of course, we're all betting on the fact that we didn't do that. But um, yeah, device drivers are dangerous, and they're also uh, very unstable. So interesting. OK. Now, of course, the last little thing I want to mention here is this notion of loading. So of course, software doesn't really sit up in space like this, except on slides, right? The software is really on the disk somewhere. And as a result, the way you execute a process is you actually go, have to go through the process of loading the, uh, the uh, program into memory and then starting its execution. OK, oops, I just, sorry, lost. Dump it down. All right, I've done that my once for the term here now. So we're, we're good. It won't happen again. OK, so yeah. So basically, without this loading process, the files would stick on disk somewhere and they never execute. So there's clearly part of the operating system needs to be responsible for loading off the disk, linking in dynamic libraries, doing all sorts of stuff. OK, we good? So that's a, a very quick whirlwind tour of some of the interesting topics. And of course, we see up here threads, address, traces, uh, address spaces, processes, files, windows, sockets. These are all topics in a typical OS class. And we're going to basically revisit them a number of times, first from the system programmer viewpoint and give you some homeworks that let you basically dive in and write some programs that use these ideas. And then we're going to dive in uh, deeper and actually implement some things like threads and address spaces. OK, so you're going to start by using them and then go on and become the, the programmer. OK, so what really makes operating systems exciting? Um, and one of the things has to be Moore's Law. And so by the way, every class, it's mandated. It, um, every EECS class has to have Moore's Law slide in it somewhere. So I just want you to know, I'm, I'm, um, this is my due diligence. Uh, this, by the way, is actually Gordon Moore. And the story that is quite interesting, and by the way, what's Moore's Law for those uh, three people in the audience that don't know what it is, is basically this idea that on a log linear scale, where linear is the gears and log is the number of transistors, you've got a straight line, which really means the number of transistors grows exponentially uh, over time. And so that's why we've got such interesting pieces of computer hardware, because we're adding more and more and more transistors every year and allowing ourselves to do more things at lower power. Okay, And that's why I have you know, on my belt a device here that's got way more power than filled rooms Okay, it, you know, 40 years ago. And, uh, and of course, it actually runs an operating system that's way more complicated than the one running on those computers 40 years ago. Okay, And that's all really due to Moore's Law. The thing that you may not get in your classes, if you've seen this before, is this diagram. I love this. This is a sketch of his transparency which, by the way, is a piece of plastic that you used to put on a device like this, and you draw on, and it would, it would project on the wall without going through, uh, going through a VGA projector. Um, I realize that's way back then. But anyway, so what's interesting is this is an actual picture of what he drew. And he was asked at a conference, you've just designed the 4004 processor. Can you predict how many uh, components are going to be uh, you know, in the future generations of chips. And what he did was, like any good scientist, he plotted a couple of points on a log linear scale, drew a line, and said this. <laughs> now, of course, he was right. But um, it was pretty impressive that the original Moore's Law was literally he put a couple of points down at a conference uh, and, and made a prediction. So anyway, so the, the bottom line here is that because the number of components keeps increasing dramatically, Every generation is more complicated and more functional. And of course, who controls functionality and complexity? The operating system. Okay. Now, um, the other thing that I like, David Culler had this slide uh, and uh, has used it many times. I, I, this is like a, um, a corollary to Moore's Law, which I think is very interesting, which is if you plot uh, the number of people per computer on a log linear scale, where the year is the linear part and the number of log, uh, log uh, number of people per, per computers on this uh, vertical axis, you actually see another straight line, which is really meaning that the number of computer or CPUs that you yourself have is growing exponentially over time. Okay, and I bet 
that everyone in this room has 50 to 100 CPUs working for them all the time. They just don't know it. Okay, think about it a little bit. You got a little Bluetooth, I mean, that's passe these days, but you got a car with 50 to 100 uh, CPUs in it. You've got your laptops, you've got your cell phones. You add it up, it goes pretty quickly. And so this is again a sign of complexity because now we've got so many more components that you have to manage. And a second interesting thing, this is another uh, mandatory slide in classes. How many people have actually seen this slide before? Wow, okay, I got a, a whole new audience here. So this is from a, a version of H Hennessy and Patterson's book that was published around uh, 2006. And what it shows here is this is not Moore's Law. This is what was often called Joy's Law, which is the increase in performance on a log linear scale was also exponential in the sweet spot here until about 2002. That was, uh, in that sweet spot, you could be lazy as a programmer. You had a program that was too slow, don't worry about it. Just wait for a year or two, run it on a new piece of hardware, it'll work fine. Okay. And around 2002, something happened. There was this sudden change that made it hard for industry to stay on that curve. So it used to be, by the way, that this uh, particular 52% per year represents about uh, doubling in uh, performance every year and a half. And what happened here was somewhere around 2002, this curve fell way off. And there are many reasons. If this was an architecture class, we'd talk about them, but things like Power density got too high, capacitance was too, uh, uh, per transistor got to be in the way, and so on and so forth. Lots of reasons. Uh, it, um, instruction level parallelism got harder and harder to find. The net effect of all of that was that suddenly you couldn't wait. You couldn't just take a, a bad piece of software and wait a little while and it would get faster. You had to actually re-architect it. Do anybody know what was the response of Intel and a bunch of companies around here? What happened? Multi-core, right? So now, how many people have a multi-core phone? Yeah, most of you, right? That is pretty crazy. A decade ago, I would have raised my hand and people would have looked at me a little strange. You know, they do that anyway, but um, they would have about my statement there. And the reason is that multi-core is a relatively recent thing. Okay, and suddenly uh, we had to have parallelism, which made the complexity harder and gave more work for the operating system. Okay, and so um, many core chips have really kind of taken the, uh, the front of the front stage. And what I think is a good harbinger of things like that is, for instance, in um, uh, Intel actually had a couple of experimental chips. Here, this one was back in 2007, was actually an 80 core multi core chip. And they had, uh, and that was just a lot of simple cores. And then there was one more functional that had uh, a smaller number of cores, but a lot more interesting network. And what this really showed was, okay, industry can make multi-core chips, and they're going to do it, and they're going to grow in interesting ways. And uh, what do you do with a chip like this? Well, first of all, I guess many core people debate, maybe it's 64, 128 cores, whatever. But the way you program this thing is you use two of the CPUs for video and audio. You have one for the word processor, one for your browser, and 76 of them are devoted to virus checking. Okay. Now, of course, uh, that seems a bit of a waste. And uh, it was kind of funny when these big chips first came out. Nobody really knew what to do with them, and they're getting a little better. But the bottom line is you could imagine processes each getting a core. That's a boring way to use them, but it's a thought. Right? You got a bunch of things running, you put one per core. Okay. Um, so basically, we have to have parallelism everywhere. Okay. So another challenge that I think is kind of interesting, which is one of the reasons that this curve fell off, was really power density. And basically, if, you, if we uh, as computer designers had continued along the path of Moore's Law and uh, increased performance, what you would have found is that by 2008, Basically, the power density inside a chip uh, that's in your cell phone on your belt would have been about the, uh, the heat coming off of a rocket nozzle. You could imagine that would be rapidly rather uncomfortable. Um, I guess you would have to sh switch which hip it was on every now and then. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was another reason why people went for parallelism. They just couldn't afford to make faster processors. Okay. So 
because we're doing Moore's Law-like graphs, let's do a couple more. Storage capacity, this one really matters to operating systems people. What's interesting here is, again, the amount of storage on a log linear scale is also a line. What's the current size of a disk drive that you can buy uh, for a des desktop, let's say? Anybody know? 10 megabytes. 100 megabytes. Terabyte. OK. Four terabytes. Boring. Six terabytes. Yep, eight terabytes soon, 10 terabytes announced. That's a lot of storage, OK? That's a lot of storage. I'm very happy to say I just bought a new TiVo that uh, has six terabytes on it. I'm happy. That's a, that's a, lot, that's a lot of Big Bang Theory or uh, other things. OK. So the other thing, of course, that's growing is um, I like Big Bang Theory. I like other things, too. But So uh, the other thing is that um, network capacity has been growing pretty rapidly. This is interesting, because this lets you tie a lot of things together okay, and make interesting, complicated artifacts, which is going to lead us to the Internet of Things soon, which all have lots of little operating systems tied together in a big global operating system. So the idea of an operating system of operating systems is actually not completely crazy. Okay. Now, going back to the Internet for a moment, um, the Internet scale, they actually measure this thing. And uh, this is a little bit old data. This is from January uh, 2013. But there's actually um, you know, 0.96 billion hosts on the Internet that are measurable. And it was actually going up in July and so on. And uh, why, is, why is, say, uh, 96 billion, uh, 0.96 billion an interesting number? What is it close to? One billion. OK, that's dumb. <laughs> the number I'm looking for here is four billion. Why is four billion an interesting number? Yes? Yeah. So if you were to look at IPv4, and we'll talk a little bit about that for those of you that aren't quite familiar with it, IPv4, which is kind of the prime internet um, uh, addressing mode for most of the internet these days really only has 4 billion unique addresses. And so we're basically coming up to uh, a number of unique hosts in the world that are very close, you know, w way within an order of magnitude of the total number of addresses. <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, and of course, uh, also close to 2.5 billion users. People track all this, and you can see it by region. It's kind of interesting to actually look at how um, a lot of the third world countries have um, a lot more users uh, per population than you might expect. Uh, it's quite, quite rapid growth. So the internet is basically reaching everywhere. Okay? And not only PCs are in the uh, internet, of course. Obviously, smartphone shipments have exceeded uh, the uh, desktop shipments for y several years now. So in 2011, for instance, uh, 487 million smartphones were sold and 414 PCs. So PCs are blasé. Some would say that means hurry up and sell your Intel stock, although I think Intel has been moving into the mobile market. But it's kind of an interesting change okay, to mobility. OK, 4 billion phones in the, in the world. Um, so, and they're all going to smartphones. So that's a really big market everybody's going after. And of course, this is a... Uh, an old slide that keeps getting reused because the ideas are, are kind of interesting, but this is sort of the societal scale information systems where everything from the little tiny smart devices all the way up through the global cloud and everywhere in between are all part of one huge parallel system. So you could say, well, I've got a cell phone and I, you know, it's not part of a big parallel system. You'd be fooling yourself because think of all of the, the apps you've got that are tying into your cell phone provider all of the searching you do on the internet, everything else, basically the only way to go off the grid is to disappear somewhere in the heart of, I don't know, Montana? Anybody here from Montana? Probably a few of you. Have you disappeared yet? No. So very hard not to be connected. And this is like a major thing. Everything's connected to everything else. And of course, what's driving that? You know, the operating systems. OK, have I made that point pretty clear? OK. This is a good topic. You guys picked a good class. So let me say a little bit about who I am. 
Um, I, you know, Professor John Kubitowicz, I said most people call me Professor Kuby, uh, and that's uh, kind of interesting. Patterson, when I first came here to Berkeley, tried to say, okay, now that you have a grown-up job, which I guess meant not graduate student, but okay, he says, you should, you should go by John. Okay, you've got to be a grown-up. You know, it never happened. Okay, everybody called me Kuby, so you can too. So I have a background in hardware design. Uh, I was on the LY Project at MIT where uh, I helped design the communication and memory management unit. Uh, it was a modified Spark processor uh, and did one, built one of the first parallel machines that actually did shared memory and message passing together in the same piece of hardware. Okay, that's a picture of my chip, which has an embarrassingly small number of transistors today, so I won't tell you, but it was a few years ago. So. Um, I uh, have background in operating systems, lots of backgrounds. I worked for Project Athena, which was one of the very first organizations that actually uh, built distributed computing, where students could sit down and their files might be on an, you know, a remote computer rather than on the local disk. Uh, we built Kerberos. We built all sorts of things that hadn't been heard of before. Um, uh, Ker Kerberos is, is an authentication service that actually is deep in the heart of uh, NTFS and a few other Microsoft projects these days. So um, that was an exciting product, uh, project. I was an OS developer, um, developed uh, device drivers and network file systems, uh, worked on clustered high availability systems uh, for a company called Clam Associates, which was uh, clustered... Uh, um, storage, basically. And um, right now, I'm actually the OS lead researcher for Tessellation OS, which is an operating system that we're developing in the Swarm Lab. I'll tell you a little bit about that as the term goes on. Um, I did a lot of work with Peer to Peer when I first got here. Uh, I was the lead on the Ocean Store project, which was uh, one of the first real Peer to Peer storage systems, which now you call it cloud computing, um, whatever the cloud is, right? Um, but uh, we were kind of interested in storing your data for thousands of years by continuously uh, repairing the data and transferring it around. And today, um, there was our logo, which was a scuba diving monkey, uh, which makes perfect sense if you think about it, right? Um, and uh, don't think too hard. So um, today, I'm actually working on a new project called the um, Global Data Plane, for the Internet of Things, which is also looking at uh, raising the abstraction from TCP IP to uh, information that's transferred, stored, archived over the long term. And so we'll talk about that. But it's a better abstraction for designing some of these devices. And then also, I actually have a hobby. I sort of work with on quantum computing every now and then. And uh, it's totally unrelated to this class whatsoever. Um, sometimes I do a, an extra lecture at the end of class that uh, has nothing to do with the topic or whatever topics people want. And uh, if you're interested, by the way, we can do that. And sometimes people ask me to talk a little on quantum computing, so I might get persuaded. But uh, if you want to talk about other things, that will work as well. So that's me. Um, as you can see looking around, this is uh, a very large class. Um, and right now, we have a very large number of people that are in the class and a very large waiting list. Um, but the reason we have such a large, uh, because we have such a large class, we also have a very large number of TAs, okay? And uh, for everybody who's here, can you basically stand up and turn around and wave at everybody? Stand up, TAs, are you guys here? Okay, good, good, yeah, yeah. So we got, uh, some of them are still, uh, our head TA is, is still in India. He's traveling back. Um, but uh, we have quite the team. This is a really amazing team, this term, and uh, I think it'll uh, make the term go really smoothly. Um, I see that my formatting's a little funny here, so you guys can obviously figure out that uh, the pictures go down a little bit here. Um, but uh, there are 12 sections. And uh, anybody not assigned to a section, that should have gone through... Telebears, everything should be fine. Okay. How many, anybody here not have a section? Lots of you. Okay, good. Well, I guess we'll deal with that when the time comes. <laughs> so, by the way, if you go to the website, which I'll mention in a moment, uh, everything about which sections are where and what TAs have what hours are all up. So, um, we actually have uh, infrastructure, the website, 
which is your end-all and be-all of information related to the class, is, as you see up there, it's uh, cs162.eecs.berkeley.edu. And um, if it isn't on the website, it doesn't matter. No, if it isn't on the website, you can ask the TAs about it, but that's probably a good place to say, do I know when the due dates for something actually are? Because we're going to try to keep that website actually up to date. Whereas anything you hear from me could be hearsay, you know, including the fact that operating systems are interesting. Maybe that's just hearsay. But if the website says it, um, you should take the class. Uh, we're also using Piazza. Uh, and um, I believe that's the right link, although right now the website has the old link, so we're going to fix that. But uh, it is 2015. And yes, we are hopefully webcasting. Uh, I think the answer is yes, um, and if we aren't today, it will be starting next time, but for sure, so we'll post a link to where the webcasts are, and I don't know if they're going to show up on YouTube uh, like they have in the past or if there's something different, but um, any questions about infrastructure? Okay, so I like to use the website as a great place to make sure everything's posted, uh, so, uh, in fact, I think one thing we're going to change about the website is even have a, a little bit of a notes thing, although the website and Piazza together is your sort of full set of information. Um, the textbook we're actually using is a little different than uh, past terms, except for last term. Uh, we're using the uh, second edition, Anderson and Dahlin, uh Operating Systems, Principles, and Practices. It's a pretty good book. Um, it's uh, softbound, so it's not... Uh, $500 like your other textbooks are. Um, I actually just went on Amazon and uh, got this pretty reasonably, but I, um, I think probably Ned doesn't have it because it hasn't been taught enough. To, is, there, is there still Ned's? Does he still sell used books, or is that, is that a thing of the past? Um, anyway, um, I reckon... What was that? He's gone? Too bad. <laughs> he was good. He's like, huh, you want a textbook? Here. Um, but I strongly recommend you get this book. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very good. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, well done. It sort of beats out the previous one pretty uh, in its clarity of thought, and so I like it a lot. Um, we'll be following along pretty closely with several of the topics that are in here, so it's a, good, it's a good book to have. And it also is a good textbook for keeping on your shelf for uh, reference in the future, so I think that's good. Try to get the second edition. Uh, I made a mistake. Uh, I figured I'd be clever and I'd hurry up and order, and, and I uh, couldn't get it on Amazon the day I was going because they were sold out, so I went to Barnes & Noble, and I ended up accidentally getting the beta first edition by not looking at the cover. So this one's got a lovely picture on the front, uh, you know, snow and mountains and trees. The other one's got kind of a, a boring total white cover, so look for the snow and mountains and trees, and probably the fact that it's a second edition on there might be a good sign, too. Um, the other thing is this previous book, Operating Systems Concepts, you can probably get from other people that have taken 162 in past terms, um, and you can also get it in the library, but uh, we're going to have a few readings from this on things that aren't covered in this textbook. And then um, we'll have also online supplements on the website, and uh, this includes uh, some appendices and sample problems, and um, other supplemental reading. And one of the things that I like to do in the OS classes, and I haven't put them all up yet, but I just like to occasionally have uh, actual research paper reading so you can see, see things uh, that we're talking about from the standpoint of the researchers. So there are a few topics like that that are kind of nice. Uh, research papers tend to be short. You know, they're a 10 to 12 page thing, so they're not awfully long. So I won't be uh, overwhelming you with too much reading. But uh, any questions on infrastructure or readings or textbooks? Yeah? Uh, Did you get the one with the white cover? Yeah, how does it it's, um, you know, it's not bad. I, I've, I've been reading the white covered one because I didn't have the one with a beautiful picture of, by the way, the snow and the mountains and the trees. Did I mention that? Um, <laughs> You're probably okay, but uh, if you have a friend that's got the other one, you might want to occasionally check. I haven't compared them head-to-head -head yet, but the newer one certainly has some typos fixed, and there's some concepts that are a little cleaner in the second one. Um, it's clear the one I got, it was a beta. It even says beta copy on the inside. I don't know if yours does, but you know, you know that that's probably got some bugs. 
Um, you know, white is black and black is white and four equals three except on Sunday. Those are the kind of things that end up in a beta book. But um, any other questions? Okay. So uh, syllabus is uh, OS concepts. Actually, we're going to start with how to navigate as a systems programmer. And um, so things like processes and I.O., networks and VMs and so on. Um, the, we're going to talk about concurrency, so thread scheduling, locks, deadlock, scalability, fairness, uh, things like that. I'm hoping that when you come out of this class, you'll know how to uh, properly synchronize something if you're asked to do it. Uh, you might actually understand what deadlocks are, are like and so on, and that's a very useful thing in this day and age. Um, you'll also know how to design thread packages uh, uh, to some extent. We're going to talk about address spaces, virtual memory address translation, protection, sharing. We're going to talk about file systems. Um, we're going to talk about distributed systems of various uh, sorts like RPC and NFS and uh, distributed hash tables and consistency and scalability and so on. So there'll be some interesting things there. Uh, we're certainly going to talk about reliability and security since that's kind of the number one key topic uh, especially if you use your credit card at, at uh, stores like Target. <laughs> You've got to be careful. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about where you can go wrong on some of these things uh, in the course. And then um, we'll also try to talk a little bit about cloud infrastructure. I just put that down as a, as a uh, sort of a buzz phrase, but that's going to include things like the Internet of Things, which I do think is pretty exciting going on right now. Okay? So... Um, you're also going to learn by doing. And so in this class, we're adopting something uh, new that I actually did in the advanced OS class that I taught a few years ago, or uh, was really we're going to have a combination of individual and group work. And the reason for that is that you want to make sure that you as an individual clearly get a handle on how to do things like uh, use C, which is the language we're going to use here. And notice I say recall C, although for some of you it may be a little bit of learning C. Um, we're going to learn how to use the tools. You're going to learn how to use Git, okay? Because Git is one of our key sort of uh, mechanisms that we have in this class. Um, the second homework is going to let you learn how to do some shell programming, so you'll actually know how to do that by the second or by uh, lab number two, which is the third lab. You're actually going to be able to build a web server, so you're going to get to use some honest to goodness uh, good tools. And then a, another important thing is we have group projects, of course. And the group projects, uh, anybody here never had a class with a group project? A few of you? Okay, so the group project adds an important dynamic because those of you that are, you know, go out into industry will have to deal with groups unless you're going to do a really small startup. Okay, if you do a really small startup <laughs> in your basement, Actually, you probably need a Keurig, a pile of uh, coffee, a computer. Maybe that you can get a, avoid a group. But anywhere else, you're going to have groups. Okay? And so um, this is an important aspect of doing this kind of systems programming, and you're going to get a chance to do that. This term, we only have three projects. Two of them are using something called Pintos, which is a C, uh, an operating system written in C that you're going to get a chance to actually do uh, some thread programming and some... Uh, address uh, space programming to produce processes. And then the last thing is going to be a key value store, which as of right now is still in Java, although we're going to see what happens with that. Okay? So we are not using nachos this term, okay? just like they didn't use nachos last term. Um, this is we're trying something new. Um, so to get started, is homework zero handed out today? Actually, it's handed out yesterday. Um, and uh, I'm just kidding a little bit, but you got to start now. And basically what it's going to do is sort of go ahead. You're going to walk through Homework Zero on the website. It's going to get your uh, CS162 account. It'll get a GitHub account. It's going to go through some registration. It's going to get your uh, VM environment, um, et cetera. You're going to get used to all of the tools. You're going to learn how to submit to the auto grader. You're going to basically get to sit down and do a bunch of stuff just so you're ready to do other stuff. Okay, so, so uh, homework zero is really about learning how the class is going to work so that when you get to do the interesting things, you don't have to worry about that other stuff. 
And that's why you have to do it starting today, because you've got to get going on it. For some of you, this is going to be a little challenging because you've never used these tools. Every one of you will be able to easily use these tools. These are really good tools. You just have to learn how to do it. Okay, it's do it the first time and you'll be great. This is individual. So the homeworks are individual, the group projects are in a group. Okay, and uh, also sections start this week. So if you don't have an officially assigned section, I guess we're uh, go to the section that fits your timing. For now, um, the section postings are up on the website. Uh, but the reason the sections are starting off right off the bat is once again, getting to learn how to use the tools you'll need for this class so that um, you're not struggling with things that are sort of how to use Git or how to program in C or how to do some of these things. Okay, now, how many of you consider yourself at, uh, C programmers? You could sit down and you could write a huge five million line C program after breakfast with a good cup of coffee. Nobody. Ah, we got one. Good. He'll help you all. No. So the thing I want you to realize is we don't have a lot of classes yet that program in C, but this is very important. It's the language of operating systems. And so what I suggest is you right away get going with C, get comfortable with it. Uh, we are going to post on the website pointers to uh, some books on C if you want to walk through a little tutorial. Okay. What did we miss? Pointers? Pointers for pointers on pointers. Oh, that's very good. Yes. Yeah, one of the fun things about C is pointers, of course. Um, the, uh, that's pretty good. I'll have to remember that. Pointers for pointers on pointers. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, I don't know how, how... Everybody know what the O'Reilly books are, the ones with the animals on the front? They're great, right? They're fun little books. They have a topic. There are good O'Reilly books on Git. There are good O'Reilly books on C. There are good O'Reilly books on Make. Uh, the nice thing about being on a Berkeley subnet, or at least within the department, uh, yeah, anywhere on, on campus, you actually have access through the digital library to the O'Reilly books. And so there are lots of O'Reilly books, and you can read them electronically without actually having to purchase them. It's like going to the library, but with your laptop. Okay, and so I actually, um, I've asked the TAs, we haven't, I don't know if we've done it quite yet, to actually post links to some key O'Reilly books that are available online for everybody. So that may help you a little bit and get going too, okay? But I, I guarantee it, if you spend time in the first week, or two weeks actually really getting your infrastructure going, the rest of the term is gonna be smooth, okay? And this is, uh, I, I can't overstress this. It's really, it seems like, oh gee, starting right off the bat. Uh, but it's really stuff that doesn't require huge amounts of thinking, but it does require you to have done it once or twice, and then you, the rest of the term will be smooth. Um, all right, wait list. So we have a huge wait list, and the class uh, size is not set necessarily by me. It's set by the department, and it depends on lots of things that I have no control over. So the other thing is, uh, this class is an example of the type of lab class that if you're in a group and uh, you decide things are really rough halfway through the term and you drop out, then your group is in trouble. And so this is uh, one of these, uh, 162 has been designated a, an early drop class, which means there's an early drop deadline here. So you need to decide if you're going to go forward with this class. Um, and I believe January 30th it's the, is, the, is Friday, is the day for dropping. And um, this is really to make the rest of the class smooth because in the past we've had uh, groups that sort of disappeared halfway through because, you know, a, a key member disappeared. So um, anyway, if you're not serious about taking the class, you know... Uh, I guess you get forced to make a decision point at January 30th, but keep that in mind. Now, as far as the wait list, this is going to be a great class, by the way, of course. Um, TAs are wonderful. The lecture is not too bad. Um, but uh, I think it'll be much smoother if we don't have people dropping in the middle. The other thing, um, 
I will point out is, again, the waitlist is not under my control, so that basically we're taking people in a department accepted order. We let a bunch of people off the waitlist. I think we've got right now like 325 or something that are actually in the class, and um, I think that's kind of our limit. I'm not, I, the number I'm bringing out, I'm pulling out of the air, it's not an exact number, but it's somewhere around there, and again, that's the department, okay? Questions on the waitlist? I, if I had my druthers, I'd let everybody in. It's just uh, the class would get unwieldy if it got too big. We may try to do bigger ones in the future, but um, I think we've got a pretty big limit right now. Any questions? No. Okay. So what, about, what are these group projects? So group projects pretty much simulates an industrial environment, as I mentioned, unless, again, you're that one person in your basement. Um, project teams this term are going to have four members. Okay, uh, in the past 162 we said four or five. Um, five is too many. Three is too few. Um, so we're going to do four. If you really, 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 really need to have a three-person team, you need to justify it to your TA, and we need to talk about it. But try to do four people teams. Okay, that will be uh, an optimal configuration. Um, and basically, in the real world, you're going to have group interactions. And so I'll actually, they, group interactions almost never go smoothly the first time. Anybody ever experienced an unsmooth group? Don't raise your hand. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually going to say a little bit uh, in a few lectures about sort of ways of managing groups uh, and so on to help a little bit with that. But um, one of the things you get with the group interaction is you learn how to communicate with your colleagues and Problems with communication are completely natural. If you have a group that runs 100% smoothly, you're in the minority. Um, that's pretty cool, but you're in the minority. And uh, you need to figure out kind of how to get the communication and how to document between your members and so on. So um, the other thing that uh, is going to be an interesting aspect of this is you should think of your TAs almost in the managerial role. Your team's working, in the, and they're your manager. And um, if you think of it that way, one of the things that's kind of interesting about that is the design document requirement is really about a high-level description for a manager that's not in the trenches with you. It's very easy when you're confronted with a design document, and we'll put up some uh, sample one uh, to see what we want, but um, it's very easy to say document every little detail of everything you're thinking you're going to do, and you end up with a 500-page document that nobody wants to read. Okay, and that's not what we're going to want. We're going to want you to be documenting your code very well, but also producing a clean uh, design spec. And we'll try to give you a better flavor for what that's about. Okay? Any questions? Good. Um, what about grading? So uh, two midterms and a final, 40%. Um, the exact proportions haven't quite been figured out yet. 40% are projects, 15% of the homework. 5% um, participation, uh, which really means it's a good idea to know, know your TAs well, because they know how you participate. I will hopefully get to know many of you. I'm not likely to end up knowing all of you by the end of the term, as much as I would aspire to that. But um, hopefully, hopefully we can uh, get somebody who knows, knows you well. Project grading is going to be uh, a well-defined rubric, which we'll put up a little bit later. Um, every submission will be submitted with git push. So uh, that actually triggers the auto grader. And one of the things we're going to try this term, and I'll say more about this as we get closer to the project, is actually pushing uh, your projects to your own repositories several times before you do the final master push. Okay, Because your TAs, who are your managers, are going to want to get some insight into what you're doing as you're designing things. Okay, and don't worry about that for now. There'll be more details. Um, okay, questions on grading? Okay. Midterms are likely to be in uh, the same time slot as a class uh, and some combination of this and another to be announced uh, place, I think. I haven't quite figured out exactly how we're going to deal with that. So. so, of course, I have to say a little bit about personal integrity code. So um, there is an honor code, as you're all aware. As a member of the UC Berkeley community, I act with honesty, integrity, and respect for others. 
Um, what that really means is things that are kind of okay, that are okay in this is explaining a concept to somebody in another group, discussing algorithms or testing strategies with other groups, helping to debug someone else's code maybe in another group is getting okay, is probably okay. Searching online for generic algorithms like hash tables, fine. Okay, so these are probably okay. Things that are definitely not okay, sharing code with, and test cases with other groups. Copying or reading another group's code. Copying or reading online code or test cases from prior years. Okay, these are not okay. And uh, we actually have some software tools that we use to check on that. So just try to be on the up and up and do your own work and your own group's work and this will work out fine. Okay? Good. So let me say a little bit about my typical, typical lecture format. Today's not a typical lecture. But um, basically, uh, it is kind of funny. Years ago, and this is becoming almost long enough ago to become uh, lost in urban legend, but uh, we actually had somebody who knew something about how people learned that came and attended some of our lectures. And, um, and they were listening to people give lectures, and what they found is the first thing that happened was um, people came into the classroom, uh, the faculty member came in and said, okay, um, before we get started, I want you to know that uh, this Friday we actually have homework three that's due, and uh, you know, group projects are due this, and, uh, and they got through a whole bunch of administrivia right at the beginning of class. And uh, what this person said was, well, wait a minute, people learn... Uh, their attention is highest at the beginning of the class. So starting off with boring administrivia is a really bad idea. Okay? And, and what it really amounted to was that people uh, learned the administrivia of the class really, really well, but when it came to the actual topic matter, they kind of waned and sort of lost, uh, lost their attention. And so what we're going to do is uh, the following, because this is a one-and-a-half-hour class, which is pretty long. Um, we're going to do the following. So... People come in and their attention is really high. Okay? And so I'm going to talk some interesting things, whatever it is, something about the class, and probably even have a little bit of a summary of the previous class at the beginning, make sure you're on the same page. And what's going to happen is, of course, after about 20 minutes, your attention's going to start to wane. And at that point, we'll take a bit of a break of some sort. Okay? Now, oftentimes, that break involves administrivia. It might involve talking about what's due. It might involve something interesting in the news, whatever. The idea is to try to get your attention back up. And, of course, whatever it is is going to be restful enough that you're going to come back up. And so we're going to talk for another 25 minutes, and you guys are really going to be doing well. <laughs> and uh, at that point, we will probably actually break so everybody can you know, run outside briefly for a few minutes and get a drink of water or something. And that'll probably help a little bit. It won't be as high as before. And then we'll talk some more. <laughs> and the, thing that, the key thing to watch for is uh, when I'm ready to finish, I'm going to say something like, and in conclusion, okay, and what happens with the in conclusion? Well, obviously, ta-da. <laughs> okay. Now, you gotta, you, you got to... Go with it, right? So wait until you hear what I'm concluding so you can figure out what the best things you learned from today or should go with before you pack up and run out the door, okay? And then, of course, you guys will be off having fun, all right? So anyway, so that's my typical lecture format. I'm going to try to break it up into kind of three pieces like that. So we'll see how well that works. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's basically, you know, a quick minute review, 20-minute lecture, five-minute administrative matters, and so on and so forth, Okay. So we'll try for that. Today's a little different because it's kind of a mixed lecture in sort of a weird form. Today, uh, I do want to point out, however, that interactivity is extraordinarily important. So yes, I've been sitting here talking at you all lecture, but I'm going to want to have lots of questions. We're going to do some uh, you know, interaction. There'll be some interesting um, debates, perhaps, going on. And so watch for that, because interaction makes the class much more interesting. OK? Uh, Having, having somebody lecture at you for an hour and a half is, uh, is very hard. Although it is useful that there's like a coffee house right over here, so I suppose afterwards you're exhausted, you drag your way over to the coffee house. Um, that might be one way to get past a long lecture, but we won't do that to you. 
So let me just uh, finish up here. We've got a few minutes still. But what is an operating system uh, for sure? What's kind of interesting is this book, the uh, Anderson and Dahlin book, basically say the operating system is three different things. A referee, which is managing, sharing, resources, protection, and isolation. It's an illusionist, which is providing a clean, easy-to-use abstraction of the actual resources so that the programmers don't have to worry about the funny details. And it's the glue. These are the common services like file systems, like programming libraries, uh, windowing systems, networking, all of those things that you really need to glue together the pieces of your application to make it work. And the operating system really does all three of these things. And I like this characterization because we can talk uh, in detail about whether a particular thing, a particular item of interest is a, a referee item, an illusionist item, or a glue item. And, you know, obviously security, uh, real-time behavior, all of that stuff kind of fits in the referee behavior. Some of the libraries uh, that uh, you use fit in the illusionist behavior. Some of the uh, glue can be interesting uh, networking services like cloud storage and so on. So we'll talk about these as time goes on. But the real challenge in all of this is, and I've alluded to this throughout the lecture, is complexity. Okay, applications consist of a whole bunch of software modules that run on a bunch of devices that implement different hardware abstractions and architectures and run different applications at the same time and fail in weird ways and can be under a variety of uh, denial of service or other attacks. And the real question is, in this mess, how do we get anything useful out of it? And once again, remember that sort of query that I started the class with. To do a web query, it's amazing that works. Okay, I want you guys to do it. This is your homework. Other than homework zero, which you're supposed to have started yesterday. I'm kidding. But you should go out and do a Google search and think about how amazing it is that that worked. Okay, that's your, that's your be amazed tonight. Actually do the search and think about it. So really, it's not feasible to test all the possible failure scenarios. It just isn't. It's just not possible. So how, does, how do things work at all? Well, they're, des, they're correct by design. You've got to start thinking about how do I design something so that when it fails or if it fails, it's a mode that's likely to be handled properly, even if I didn't foresee it somehow. And that's pretty hard to do when you think about it. But there'll be some things we talk about a little bit. And so, um, for instance, here's a modern processor. Okay, I don't know how often you guys have gotten to, oops, shoot, gotten to see things like this, but um, this is a Sandy Bridge, so this is a couple of years old, but it's got four cores on it, it's got a huge uh, level three cache, it's got a graphics processor, and then it's got a systems agent that handles a bunch of I.O., and it's actually got a ring bus on it that communicates between the processors, and this is one chip. That's one chip. Okay, and you know you you look at the Sandy Bridge I/O configuration. So if you have a desktop, you've got basically that one chip, and then you've got uh, basically something that used to be called a South Bridge, um, and basically this actually communicates with the chip and has gives you all of your interesting I/O, and uh, plus it's uh, the chip itself typically has memory, uh, graphics, and so on connected directly to it. But down here you see things. Uh, BIOS, okay, you see uh, networking, you see serial ATA for disk drives, PCI Express, and so on. All of this stuff is the domain of the operating system because you, as a programmer, don't want to think about it. Now, you, as an operating system designer, may find this really cool. I do. But at some level, it'd be nice to get away from that and think of, not think about it, right? And that's the complexity at the local level that the operating system is handling. Now, um, this is an, an old slide, but um, this is an example of a bunch of computer architecture topics. And you see everything here from things down at the, uh, uh, you know, pipelining and hazards and reordering and speculation and vectors up through caching, up through DRAM, through uh, SSDs and disks and cloud storage and networking and all of these things. It's pretty complicated, and somebody, namely the operating system, has got to manage that complexity and hide it from everybody except for the OS programmers. And um, I love this particular slide because uh, this is very old now, but it kind of gives the point, right? If you look at the NASA space shuttle in millions of lines of code, that's over here, okay? And then you look at Windows Vista at 50 million lines of code, and you can kind of see the problem. Just in sheer lines of code, there's, you know, you can imagine how the heck does this actually work? 
Okay? And I like, I like this Mars Pathfinder. This is, you should look up Pathfinder afterwards. This is a fun uh, rover that uh, was one of the most successful uh, early projects on Mars ever. This is um, a little Martian, by the way. And um, the Pathfinder had very limited hardware. Okay? It had a 20 megahertz processor. It had uh, 128 megabytes of DRAM. It had a real-time operating system called VxWorks. It had cameras, scientific equipment, batteries, solar panels, locomotion equipment, um, lots of independent processes working together. By the way, I think this sounds like something I could buy at Fry's these days. Everybody see the quad rotors they sell down there? Um, you can't hit the reset button. The thing's on, on Mars. Did I mention that? Right? So it's on Mars. It crashes. What do you do? Okay. Uh, you have to make sure that you can always reboot it. Okay, it's got to always receive commands on Earth, even when it crashes. Okay, um, individual programs must not interfere with each other. So suppose the uh, Martian Universal Translator module is buggy, it better not crash the antenna positioning system that makes sure that you can always reboot the system. Okay, um, all that the software, uh, any software can crash occasionally, so you have to have automatic restart, you have to get diagnostics back to Earth, periodic checkpoints, and so on. And uh, certain functions are clearly time critical, like the need to so uh, stop before hitting something. That's pretty time critical, um, et cetera. And there's a couple of interesting things to note about this. So first of all, there's a lot of similarity with the Internet of Things, because there's a lot of little devices that people are looking at these days that are in places you can't reboot. They have very limited uh, um, computing power. They have very limited memory, and they're trying to do real-time stuff and you've got to somehow make sure that you can get at them. Okay, that's one thing. The second, and we'll talk about this when we get into synchronization, one of the things that was kind of interesting is this particular uh, device had a, um, a priority inversion problem that would actually cause it to get stuck in it rebooting all the time, and they were actually able to uh, download enough diagnostics from Mars to debug it and send the right updated uh, patches and actually fix it, okay, remotely, right? So there's a lot of interesting lessons for there. But this is a good example of um, handling complexity and somehow handling it remotely. So how do we tame it? So every piece of computer hardware is different. So we have different CPUs, memory, disk, devices, et cetera. And the questions are sort of, does a programmer need to write a single program that performs everything? Do they have to uh, be altered for every different piece of hardware? Does the faulty program crash everything? You can ask a bunch of these questions, and we will as the term goes on. And the answer really is uh, that we want to provide standard interfaces. I started to say this earlier, but um, basically what we're saying is that there is a standardized machine interface, and the operating system is handling that complexity and providing a nice, clean API up to the users. And that clean API is doing all sorts of things, like uh, making up for deficiencies in the hardware, like dealing with hardware crashes, like dealing with all sorts of interesting limitations by presenting uh, APIs up to the user that look easier to use. Okay, good example is the infinite file API. Right? So disk drives are finite, but maybe you have an infinite file API by what? Extending into the cloud. Maybe you could do that. Right? There's a lot of interesting options there for, for virtualization. Um, you'll have a lot of chance to run into virtual machines. Anybody here actually use virtual machines? Okay, if you haven't, you will. But there's at least two types of virtual machines. Uh, one is uh, what we call a process virtual machine, which is what an operating system provides to support the execution of things, and a system virtual machine, which basically gives you the ability to uh, execute an entire operating system in a container. Okay, and so here's an example of process VMs, which is going to be our next topic. Uh, every process actually thinks it has all of the memory and all of the CPU. Every process thinks it owns all the devices, uh, different devices seem to all have the same high-level interface and devices. Um, so that, what does that mean? That means that that uh, USB key that I mentioned and the disk drive look identical to the higher layers. Okay, and basically that's the process VM. The other thing we get out of this is fault isolation, so that if one process crashes, it doesn't crash others. 
And we get protection and portability. And so those of you that have used Java, which I think is probably everybody in here are familiar with some of the protection features. Um, the, uh, hello. The system virtual machine is, looks like this, where essentially we have a virtual machine layer that allows us to run several different operating systems in the same machine. So each, this FreeBSD, this Windows NT, this Windows XP, each of these operating systems think they're running on their own machine, but you're giving them the illusion that they're not, and that's a um, system virtual machine. Okay, you're going to encounter both of these. All right. So what is an operating system really? Let's close up a little bit. Most likely, it's you could talk about pieces like memory management, like I.O. management, CPU scheduling, communications, multitasking, or file systems. Sure, why not? Multimedia support? Sure. User interfaces? The browser? Is the browser part of the uh, operating system? How many people think a browser is part of the operating system? Hmm. That was an interesting argument that was uh, before your time. We'll talk about that another time. Is this only interesting to academics? It's hard to say. But let's, what's uh, an actual operating system's definition? There's basically no universally accepted one. One, people, uh, one person might say it's everything a vendor ships when you order the operating system is the operating system. Okay. The other option is the one program running all the time in the computer is the kernel. Okay, so everything is either a systems program uh, or an applications program um, on top of the kernel. This is a pretty clean one for the operating system is the kernel, and we'll probably use that a lot this term. But um, So anyway, I'm going to finish up uh, for now. I'm going to say in conclusion, we'll talk about processes next time, but operating systems provide a virtual machine abstraction to handle hardware. Uh, they coordinate resources and protect users from each other. They simplify application development by providing standard services, and uh, they provide an array of fault containment, fault uh, tolerance, and fault recovery so that when hardware fails, you don't have to know about it. And uh, CS162 is going to combine all sorts of interesting topics from other areas to give you a flavor for operating systems. So with that, I'm going to say don't forget homework zero. Do homework zero. And don't forget to do a Google search after you leave here and be uh, amazed. Okay, those are your two pieces of homework, go to sections tomorrow or Friday. <laughs>